Welcome to another edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Aaron Dykes. Today is Monday, April 16th, 2012. Tonight on the InfoWars Nightly News, Obama's Secret Service agents punished for carousing with Colombian hookers. But is this just disinfo to keep public opinion away from something more diabolical? Plus, Darren McBreen returns from Roswell, Georgia to file a report on the local Agenda 21 tactics that took a man's life. Then, we speak with Noble Live filmmaker Holland Vanden Neuenhoff and lead investigator of the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee, Dale Phillips, on the upcoming anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombings. All that and more on the InfoWars Nightly News. And so it's April 16th. As the tax deadline looms, we have a story on taxes for you. Federal bureaucrat government and taxes are the American dream. Report up on InfoWars by Kurt Nemo. So people have always been angry about taxes and all the more because it goes to fund the unconstitutional private Federal Reserve Bank that charges us for all the money they loan to the government, and we pay it back each year in the forms of taxes. And you heard Reagan's report from the 80s, not one stinking dime goes to pay for any of the federal budget or any of it. It's all just to the wrong stuff. But finally, we have a government official willing to put her voice on the line to speak for principles and what the American dream is really all about when it comes to taxes. Here are the words of Secretary of Labor Hilda Solis. I want to tell you that we need to stand up. And we must not forget that at this critical moment in time, we have to understand what the president is fighting for. And the president is fighting right there with you and I. And it's about fairness. It's about fairness in the workplace. It's about fairness in education. And it's about fairness in terms of what services are provided by government. And if we can't have a say so in that, then this isn't the dream that all of us have aspired to be a part of. Because if people aren't paying their taxes, those that can afford it, the billionaires and millionaires, even the folks, as you heard yesterday, that were in the White House, that agreed to pay more. They want to pay more because they know it's their obligation. Because that's what we stand by, those principles. That's very, very important for us to understand what the president is fighting for, for fairness. So there's the fairness and the principles. The president is fighting so they can tack on more government services. You could continue to pay for them, and they're going to pass the Buffett rule to give the illusion of taxing the rich when it's really just squeezing the middle class and, yes, some nouveau riche people. But the real billionaires, the real wealth is all offshore. They're all in foundations. Little clubs are all a part of. None of them pay taxes. you got all the tax cheats in government, but they're coming for your money. That's Agenda 21. That's the clampdown on America and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. There's been all the outrage about killing American citizens overseas through drones, the Anwar al case. That got worse after Obama said, yeah, we got the right to do it. We'll do it when we need to. Then they passed the National Defense Authorization Act, NDAA, putting on paper they can indefinitely detain Americans for whatever reason they want, no due process. Now, this incredible ro report continues to surface as they try to push it through Congress. IRS travel ban revoking citizenship by stealth. So that's up by Paul Joseph Watson and Alex Jones getting into how there is no requirement that the taxpayer be guilty or even charged with tax evasion, fraud, or criminal offense, only that the citizen is alleged to owe the IRS back taxes of 50000 or more. So yes, you're hearing that now. Travel bans, you won't be allowed to fly out of the country. Your passport will be revoked. You won't be issued a passport if you're accused of owing the IRS money. And it goes on to explain how there is no judicial determination, only an IRS determination, and that is enough to restrict your constitutional rights to freedom of travel and on and on, all without any kind of due process. Don't you see what direction this is going between the assassinations, the indefinite detention, and now this IRS thing, there's just no, no due process. They're just destroying the country and saying they're going to do whatever you want. And so what's going to happen if unconstitutional government health care continues to go through and people refuse to pay those taxes in mass? Maybe a lot of individuals won't be at the $50,000 level, but will we see a greater federal response on that basis too, that now it doesn't need to be 50000 to deny your passport? Now we'll just deny
deny for anyone who's going against current government policy because they have the right to determine what services you're going to pay for. That's part of the dream of America is to argue for more and more taxes. And if you don't like it, you don't go anywhere and they might come kill you. Just incredible. Uh, probably in different words, Alex has a report summing up on how really this IRS travel ban amounts to internal checkpoints, greater suspicion in America. It is part of the police state. Here's that report now. My friends, do you know one of the key hallmarks of a hardcore police state, whether it was Soviet Russia or Nazi Germany? Governments would take political dissidents' passports away. In the United States, that's only done if you've been charged with espionage or if you're out on bail for a serious crime. The IRS has written a law that's passed the Senate and is now in the House and Forbes and other publications are reporting on it like it's no big deal. Hey, if the IRS says you owe back taxes, you're not going to be allowed to travel outside the country. They're going to take your passport. How many times have I told you this was coming? This is exactly what the IMF and World Bank, the consortium for the international arm of the private Federal Reserve, have called for for more than 15 years. A global cashless society. Already many jobs, you've got to get TSA approval and authorization to have them. I saw Homeland Security nine years ago on C-SPAN say, you're not going to get on a plane if you haven't paid your taxes. You're not going to get a driver's license. You're not going to be allowed to work. This is total enslavement. This is beyond anything we've seen in history. It is incredibly illegal. Travel is a right, not a privilege. A passport is a right as a citizen. This represents withdrawing and revoking your citizenship. That's what it is under another name. They tried to pass a bill last year for any reason the president wishes outside of a court to take your citizenship away, and then they say they can secretly arrest you or kill you. When he couldn't get that passed, he just signed the NDAA and said he can secretly arrest you or kill you. Well, a law that's unconstitutional is null and void, Marbury versus Madison. What this represents is capital controls. When governments start to collapse throughout history, they always try to clamp down on people leaving the country with money. Bottom line, the IRS is the collection agency for the private Federal Reserve. Pre-1913, dollars that were fiat were backed partially by silver and gold and said United States note on them. After 1913, they said Federal Reserve note. In 63, Kennedy reissued $5 bills that said United States note on them, and he signed an executive order to begin the abolishment of the private Federal Reserve and its collection agency of the IRS. That's why the banksters killed him. My point is, yes, a country has to have taxes, but these aren't taxes. These are levies to private international banks. Just as Europe admits, they're now under Goldman Sachs dictatorship. Not through money they owe. Goldman Sachs got their governments to sign on to the derivative fraud they created. This is so incredible. And now the banksters are saying, if you don't pay all the taxes we want directly into our private coffers of the Federal Reserve, outside of a court, outside of a conviction, outside of law, we're going to put you on a no-fly list. Just like Rahm Emanuel, former chief of staff at the White House, said at a gun grabber meeting. He said, look, if you're on a no-fly list, over 2 million Americans are on that, by the way, you're not going to be able to buy a gun. That is, if you are on the no-fly list because you are known as maybe a possible terrorist, you cannot buy a handgun in America. One of the things you don't know about is the number of people that we have turned away because their name has been on the watch list uh, or on the no-fly list. Only my mom could, but not me and my dad, because both me and my dad are, are on the watch list. Now they say they want to expand that to where if you haven't paid your taxes, you can't buy a gun. Of course, these are taxes to the IRS, and they just say you haven't paid. The bankers are taking control of our lives. They are squeezing Europeans with the exact same system. This is hardcore fascism. This is incredible tyranny, and we've got to defeat this legislation that is now in the House. Get these articles and get them out to everybody and demand that the corporate whore dinosaur media cover this because these are internal checkpoints, internal passports, and they're saying they're going to revoke your citizenship. That's what this does, extrajudicially.
This is off the Richter scale when it comes to despotic, oppressive tyranny. The Federal Reserve is engaged in a total coup d'etat over due process and threatening to revoke our citizenship and pull our passports if we don't fully submit to the bankers. The bankers are pressuring local governments to raise the local property tax that we didn't have till 60 years ago in this country that turns your property uh, into basically a government rental. This is not land of the free, home of the brave anymore. Okay, we're off the charts tyranny. It's time to recognize it, rebuke it, arrest these scumbag New World Order people, and take our government back. Because this is all going to be selectively enforced. Massive numbers of Congress don't pay taxes. Most of these federal employees don't, and they're left alone. Criminal Congress can insider trade and say they're allowed to. Corzine can steal billions, and lie to Congress and get caught and not get in trouble. But these crooks run the Federal Reserve and its IRS collection agency, and they're saying they're going to take anything they want without even a court hearing and take your passport. We've got to get this information out to everybody. This just proves how tyrannical these scum are. And so we can move on to other corruption in the government, other little scandals going on, although this one's been far splashier and probably less substantial. As you know from all the mainstream reports over the weekend, Obama's trip to Colombia was compromised when Secret Service people were accused of not paying hookers. And then they brought in members of the military and others, and they've detained them and taken them back home, and they're getting ready to charge them with violating the Secret Service codes. That's if we were even told the truth. We really don't know. It's hard to believe uh, that this would have broken out into a major news scandal rather than just being covered up from within. If indeed this is going on, we know high-level officials are engaged of all kinds of unspeakable things. But why is this happening now in the middle of the Summit of the Americas? Is it because there's the Cuba question on the table from a number of Latin American countries uh, calling to open back up negotiations there uh, in terms of the U.S. to do away with the travel? bans there to take off sanctions. Does it have to do with the fact that multiple Latin American countries are saying it's time to legalize and decriminalize drugs because the drug war has failed, putting incredible pressure on the U.S. to respond to the obvious failure of the drug war, all the scandals where they've been caught propping up drug cartels, shipping in themselves from Afghanistan and other military-guarded locales? Is it because Wall Street has been caught laundering so much drug money? Does it have to do with all the partnerships and unions and global agreements they're trying to do with these Latin American countries, which are routinely protested and very unpopular with the people? Or does it have to do with the questions raised by Gordon Duff in the Veterans, uh, Veterans Today article, was the presidential detail penetrated by an assassin? Assassination Columbia, what if it ain't about whores? And he gets into how the story seems very unbelievable because of the factors we mentioned, because power tends to corrupt, but it also tends to cover up for its own scandals, not really wishing to reach the media. And so Gordon Duff raises the question, was the Secret Service, was the military, was the president's detail possibly infiltrated by uh, someone from a foreign government or representing some something else? You've got them trying to push for the Iran war and... The U.S. has at least initially said no to that. You've got other factors going on. Was that part of this story? Were they hiding something? And that something is vulnerability, in other words. What's really going on here? We don't know. Was it some kind of honey trap with the women involved here? Was it really an issue of just not paying a woman when they're traveling with all this cash and they're so spendthrifty and willing to just expunge on on all kinds of needless affairs. You've got Secretary of State Hillary Clinton partying in Colombia, all these other officials on camera and in the media doing this stuff. We're gonna keep an eye on this. It appears to be a distraction from the other major issues going on. We, of course, don't know. But you've got even more federal government corruption, the facade of federal justice in this Montana case where Butte, Montana City Judge Stephen Kombich has been uh, accused and convicted now of bribery in federal court. He was sentenced this week to paying only $5,000 in restitution, 
even less than he was charged with accepting in bribes, a number that was at least 13,000, uh, which came about from routinely dismissing traffic tickets and other citations for bribe. And he's got, I don't know, three or five years of probation. And then in this article from Montana Festo, they compare it to the outrageous case, especially by comparison, where a medical marijuana caregiver named Chris Lindsay is also facing charges. Those charges are more than 690 years or 25 consecutive life sentences for administering medical marijuana in the case there. So why is that case so heavily punished, but government corruption admitted bribery where he's convicted, they just get off with a fine and probation. What in the world is going on? Well, it's just a corrupt system. They go after whoever they can and they let off as many inside officials as they can, unless there's enough pressure to put the skids on them. Anyway, we turn now to what debatably should have been the leading story for the whole day. It's a very important thing because we know they've been looking to clamp down on the internet. Bilderberg, among other elite groups, has met for years with the head of cybersecurity, always looking for a way to control the internet. We know they want to shut it down. We know they want the kill switch. We know they don't want true free speech. And we know they want to kind of corporatize it, mainline it into almost a cable TV style system. And we also know that the past year has been SOPA legislation, PEPA legislation, the ACTA Treaty, all of those have been heavily criticized by a number of prominent people online, some of the biggest companies, in fact, and all the uh, hacker communities, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent, all the protest communities, all kinds of tech blogs, and on and on. The internet has clearly been against these treaties, but they're not gonna back down. They continue to try to push new legislation, and the newest is CISPA. C-I-S-P-A, and they are now planning to protest this as well as they should. A coalition of advocacy groups has begun a week of intense protests against the latest attack on the free and open internet, the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, CISPA. The draconian legislation would force companies to ignore existing privacy laws and share information with the federal government. At the forefront of the coalition's protest efforts is a Twitter takeover whereby users are asked to use these hashtags in an attempt to create the same level of publicity generated at the height of the protests against the Stop Online Piracy Act or SOPA, only they're not planning to black out the internet this time. Maybe they should, or an even bigger stunt to raise awareness of how they're continuing to just try to push through all this draconian internet legislation until people give up. Well, obviously the answer is we can't give up. We know they want to control the internet. They're going to change the names. We just have to keep a pace of it and fight back against it. Just something we're going to keep an eye on. But Alex has again filed a report fresh for today. Here it is hitting the most important issues on the CISPA, the latest aspect of internet takeover. Alex Jones here with an emergency alert dealing with the First Amendment and free speech worldwide. You know that in communist China and in many other countries, they are setting up internet IDs, internet taxation systems, internet blacklist, and Microsoft and other big U.S. companies like Yahoo and others have actually aided and abetted the communist Chinese and other authoritarian countries in setting up these surveillance grids, as well as these systems that they use to blockade information or firewalls. Now, these companies are also involved here in the United States with the recording industry and others supporting CISPA. Now, we were able to shoot down SOPA because of massive grassroots awakening and protest, but the system always comes back again. So we've got to expose CISPA that mainline analysts at CNET News, you name it, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, others, call the most draconian anti-freedom legislation they've ever seen. This makes SOPA look tame in comparison. It allows the Pentagon and the federal government to shut down any websites they want. It allows companies to surveil everybody and give the data and share the data and sell the data to the government in live time. It allows the Pentagon to attack people's websites. It is totally and completely anti-American, but it's also just anti-freedom. 
We have an article up at Infowars.com written by Steve Watson that boils down the fact that activists and freedom lovers are launching a new operation against this tyranny. Headline, activists aim to crush internet censorship bill. Week of protest against CISPA begins. And it's got all the links to the bill, to the Twitter and uh, Facebook revolts that are happening, to all the sites and groups that are taking action. We had the blackout earlier. That worked. Now we're going to use some other tactics. And together we can do this. Do things like shoot your own YouTube video, just speaking out against it. And whether it gets 100 viewers or a million, all of that together, that swarm of activism will expose this tyranny. We have to ask ourselves, why are governments right now openly worldwide trying to sign treaties and pass their own legislation to restrict the web? Because the big mega banks that are looting all of our countries through austerity to pay off their derivatives openly know the people are waking up and realize that we have corporate fascism worldwide setting up what they call a new world order. And so they can't allow a truly free internet to create a Western spring against the globalist. They want to use the internet selectively to start rebellions against countries they want to overthrow. They don't want the people to peacefully use it to expose what they're doing. I saw numbers just last week where record low uh, viewership for TV and cable television, record increase for alternative media online. Look at what we're doing with Infowars.com, the nightly news. Look what countless others are doing with their blogs and news organizations engaging in real research. So there is a threat that the system is desperate to basically quell, the threat of liberty, of true diversity of ideas. The system sees freedom as a threat, and that's why there's a perfect storm of dinosaur corporate whore media that can't compete with free media and government that can't compete with free media coming together to try to sell the end of the free Internet as we know it. If we beat this, they'll come back again. But that's what's fun about this. It's not, oh, gosh, they came back. It's, hey, we beat them. Now they're coming back for another fight. Good. We have to make this the sporting event of our times, fighting for liberty, not going and watching a football game and getting drunk. We have to understand it's fun to be involved. It's fun to be informed. It's certainly not fun to be a slave and to live in a country that has a censored Internet that's run by the Pentagon, where they make all the different IT professionals get federally certified and uh, agree to spy on people for the government and to put government Trojan horse hardware into all of the ISPs. I'm talking about the little ISPs. Just a few weeks ago, we saw the CIA director come out and say, hey, we are spying on everybody through their appliances Ha, 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 when you buy a cell phone or a new washer or dryer, it's got tech built into it that the uh, smart meters dial into and we listen to you. You know, the Fourth Amendment ain't what it used to be, he laughed, at a NQTEL CIA public meeting where they steer money into the industry uh, to fund all of this. They're trying to just bring censorship out in the open and admitting it's an end to the Fourth Amendment and privacy, admitting it's an end to due process, admitting they'll just shut your site down or take it over if they want or spy on you or have the Pentagon attack your site if they don't agree with your information. In closing, we've seen people like Senator Lieberman and others say, if somebody's criticizing the war, shut down their website. He has said he wants to be able to send an email to YouTube and have people's videos taken down. That's actually happened to us before when we show videos exposing war crimes. So this is happening. Jay Rockefeller a few years ago said we would have been better off never inventing the Internet. He's one of the top senators who's trying to push all this right now. The system is desperate. At last year's Bilderberg, who was there? The head of Google, all the tech people. We predicted all this was coming because our moles inside said they want to clamp down on the web. It's here. It's happening. But public pressure is so huge that even Google on the surface has to act like they're against what's happening. So let's come together again. Let's get the storm of awakening happening. Uh, this breakdown, uh, CISPA, Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, and it goes over it. CISPA, Bill Tech's basic definitions, got all the graphics. Uh, take part in resisting this electronic Berlin wall the system is trying to drop down 
over our digital freedom to communicate in the online marketplace that is the town square. It is the modern town square. Here's the key. The only big group publicly supporting this is Facebook, who's called their users dumb effers and, and, and makes jokes. <laughs> users of Facebook trust us. What a bunch of idiots. Ha, ha, ha. That's the arrogant attitude of this scum. Let's show them that we're awake to what they're doing. Let's go into Facebook especially. And, and this video and the bill and the information out there and get it out to everyone. I take you back to InfoWars Nightly News and Aaron Dykes. And so we've got all this government corruption, all this targeting of Americans, and it goes on and on. If they don't kill actual people, they kill their animals or they destroy their property. And we see that again in this case, where Michigan unleashes armed raids on small pig farmers and forces farmers to shoot their own pigs. And it's all based on this invasive species order because you've got so many wild pigs across the country. And here in Michigan, the Department of Natural Resources have in at least two counties in Calcasa County and Sheboygan County gone after farmers for raising certain breeds of pigs that they're raising humanely independently on small farms. Meanwhile, no one ever pays attention to the conditions at factory farms run by huge corporations. And so what they did was they got these farmers, forced them to kill each individual pig, old, young, doesn't matter. And it's all in the name of saving the earth. Once again, this is Agenda 21. And they're just destroying the entire livelihood of these farmers economically. They're killing the stock. Uh, they undoubtedly depend on part of it for food as well. And for what justification? It's totally bunk policy. Uh, that story goes on. It's up at Natural News and at InfoWars by Mike Adams. And he's calling for people to do an armed arrest of the officials from the natural resources because these departments are totally out of control. They don't even necessarily go in with good justification, and then people, animals, property must die or be destroyed. It's just crazy. We had another case here in Austin. Uh, of course, last week, the officer killed a lot of duty paid to him, a lot of respect and honor. Uh, yet this week, a cop shows up to the wrong house and kills a man's dog because he's responding to a domestic dispute that's not even going on at that property. Michael Paxton said his dog, Cisco, came in from the backyard where they were playing Frisbee. Uh, as the officer approached him, held a gun up to him and asked him to explain himself. Before he could, the dog comes out, starts barking, and Paxton ex tries to explain to the officer the dog is no threat, barks as any dog would at a street stranger being on the property, but instead the officer kills the dog dead for no good reason. And we've got that article up. It was also covered by KXAN today, but he's got a Facebook account out about the untimely, unjust death for Cisco, calling for justice there. That's where we originally got the report where he had written up his account of what had happened. And again, the police didn't even bother to check the address match, the one they'd been given in the phone call asking for a response. Instead, he just shows up and kills a dog. It's tragic the way these things happen. And, of course, it's reminiscent in many ways of the Andrew Wordis case that we've been covering all week long. We sent reporters, of course, to Roswell, Georgia, to find out why a man simply raising backyard chickens who had been in dispute with the city for years over Agenda 21 sustainable development policies was shot dead and why when our reporters went to Georgia where they refused entry even into City Hall uh, questions weren't to be answered on and on we have that report now filed by Darren McBreen and Marcos Morales let's go to it I can. You can record me, right? I'm not recording you. okay I have right. no reason to record you all right so in order to talk to them do we have to write something first or I don't understand. We're with KLBJ and, and uh, uh, Free Speech Systems give in Austin, me, Texas. Give me a card, show me your credentials, and I'll run into the poll for you. That's 22, Sierra 2. Really? Got two 54s here. Claim they're with the news media, reluctant to show me any ID. No, 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 not reluctant. He's going to get it. Not resistant. Okay. I said reluctant. Not reluctant. I said so reluctant. And I said, okay, and I'm correcting you. No, you're not correcting me, sir. I'm correcting you. I'm correcting the situation. You take, turn the camera off, okay? 
I have no legal obligation to do so. I'm documenting this case in particular, public servants in public, performing a public service. So, yeah, yeah. Watch him over there. You're the one carrying the camera. I'm just to, the cameraman. Just need to see your ID, sir. My identification? Yes. What on what basis? Yeah, what yeah, yeah. I, I'm not infringing on any, any private property. You're bringing right a camera onto the property. You do not know who you are. I need your ID, please. For On what basis, though? Sir, if you need my press pass to show that we're press, this guy is the press. I want you to go stand in front of the Jeep, please. I want to be over here where I can talk to you. All right. One, two, three. Now, we're compliant. On public yeah, property. Nobody in there in City Hall, and I said, well, and he said, but there's, you know, there's a uh, a spokesperson, Marcos, that you talk to? Yeah, so media I said, relations. So I said, well, let me go talk to her, and I'll just ask her a few questions. Mm -hmm. And then this gentleman. Yeah, he just, he just went up to talk with Julie Bregbill. She, I told you to quit filming yeah, me. Yes, sir, but you're a public servant on public property in a public place. And we are media. How are you doing? Good, how are you doing? Um, we're not trying to be resistant. We're not trying to be... I understand. We're just doing our job that we've been sent on here to do. No, sir, no, sir. You, you asked for ID. press I had to pass. Come back and this get is... it. You asked me for a press pass, not ID. And we we uh, aren't breaking any laws. So I didn't say you were breaking laws. I yes, said we have policies you said it was regarding the cameras. Or... Yeah, we don't allow it without a permit. I don't know that you were with the press. I told him to turn his camera off. But the credentials are there. Right. Those are the here's, press credentials. Here's, here's what I can tell you to do. Okay. What I would do is contact you with Brett. And that's the person you talked to? I have no idea who you talked to. Yes, the, uh, Man, I just tried to Burnett walk in the hall. I didn't know it would be uh, great such a fuss. Burnett lady, short hair. Yeah. yeah. That's why we're here. We're here to right. figure all these facts out. Well, if you would have said that to begin what with, then number? I could have referred That's you to the right place. But I believe you talked with Julie, and she sent okay. you away. She didn't send me away. She didn't tell me to leave. She okay. didn't express any interest in me not. You at, did, did you not ask her if the city council was here? That's exactly. And what, what I did she say? She said they're part time. They're not here. So I said, okay, let me go out. And in my, I didn't tell her where I was going. She didn't tell me to leave. In my head, I decided I'm going to go out and confer with my reporter to yes. figure out the next move. Okay. And in doing so, we decided we should go back in there and ask her if she wouldn't mind us shooting some footage. You know, another thing I'm curious about, like you said, we had to be authorized media, but why wouldn't a person with a video camera like I'm? I'm from Austin, Texas. We have a huge city hall, and we are we could walk in with cameras and and just hey, how you doing, sir? And talk to people up the stairs inside the building. So imagine our surprise when we're just blocked right away. What are you doing what, with those cameras? It's just right. kind of odd to me. Yeah, but can't answer that, sir. Okay, and I'll be honest with you. All right. Are we allowed to videotape the, the building, for example, for like a B-roll or something? I mean, is this is this privately owned property? Yeah, and I would check with Julie. In, yeah, in Georgia, in Georgia, really, there's no publicly owned property. Everybody owns something mm -hmm. as far as property. But uh, I don't personally. I don't care what you. Okay. Just from the outside. That's up, just that's up to him. He's he's a city hall officer. Then, uh, so it's his. You know, he's more familiar with what they allow at city hall than I am. Sure, sure. And uh, you know, if he tells you, he ask you not to, then. Okay, so I you would, wouldn't you wouldn't be comfortable with us videotaping the building? I, I would like for you to talk with Julie Brookville, okay. we'll and if she says fine, I'm fine with it. I'm okay. just carrying out my duties here at city hall. You guys get much excitement in this small town? Is that off now? Turn it off. No, it, it's not off. Yeah, we're up at Chicken Man's house. Well, go. Yep. Cool. You have any questions? Feel free to answer. You know, I'll be glad to. Were you called? Were you called in on that at all? Or the Chicken Man? That's a tragic story. Yes. Yeah. But they're off days, so neither one of us are here. Fortunately, yeah. unfortunately, fortunately, off that day. So. Okay, but remember he didn't want the city 
we have to get permission for that. I'm getting footage of the cops driving off. Can they make it any more difficult? Now, did you get, was the audio working on that or was it just going to the microphone? Just going to the shotgun. Okay, we got shotgun, good. Well, a funny thing happened to us in front of City Hall in Roswell, Georgia today. We showed up here moments ago to enter City Hall, see if we can interview some of the people in uh, the city council, perhaps talk to the mayor. And we were immediately met by police officers. Okay, but who told us we were not allowed to enter City Hall. Also, they told us we weren't allowed to take any photographs and that we must have the proper credentials to photograph in the area. Um, you know, we had a little scene that went on for a while. Uh, Marcos and I kind of uh, schooled them on our uh, basic rights and that we're allowed to photograph. But interesting, this family over here moments later showed up and began taking pictures right there in front of City Hall. So apparently, some people are allowed to, others, InfoWarriors, are not. I'm Darren McBreen, InfoWars.com. Well, that is a pretty colorful color of law. Somehow you're not allowed to film out in public. Somehow there is no public property in Georgia, and you have to ask permission to even film a building, and they didn't want to let them inside the building. Nobody wanted to answer questions. They didn't even think cameras were allowed to roll. So I guess there's no First Amendment in Georgia. There's only Agenda 21. And that's what, that is what it is. It is curbing industrial development. It's curbing first world industrialization overall in favor of this world government policy they're pushing forward. Not that these local cops know anything about it at all. They just know, tell people to shut up and don't ask questions about Andrew Wordis and why he died for having backyard chickens. Had a dispute for years with the city. Suddenly it ends in an explosion and his death when they try to evict him in a raid. But what is going on more behind the scenes is this is all dating back to 1991 when they had the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development where they had the Agenda 21 rolled out uh, at the hands of top globalist Murray Strong, among others. And you've heard from George Hunt, you've heard from Michael Kaufman and others who were at those meetings, who covered those meetings, who read the reports, in detail, they want to totally curtail the United States Western society development. They want to redistribute wealth to the third world, and they want to clamp down on everything that has made America great, everything that's made Americans wealthy, hardworking, and that's that's what we see here. Yuri Messon has fleshed out a lot of quotes from that UNCED conference back in 1991, uh, and he ties it to the Andrew Wordis event, saying the tragic case of Andrew Wordis we learn what it means to live under the yoke of Agenda 21. It's repeated calls for deindustrialization and the developed world to be ended by the global elite, and it's much more than that. And so you've got this Ignacy Sachs writing a report 1991 uh, in which he uses what Urian calls the ultimate euphemism. The blueprint for mass death is now the virtuous green path. And it says, to be meaningful, these strategies have to be carried out long term over the span of several decades, 35 to 40 years at a good time, a good compromise to keep people distracted, unable to follow the real issues. God knows those cops in Roswell, Georgia certainly couldn't follow the issues. It's hard enough knowing what you're looking at and trying to research it. It's all this long term smoke screen to keep the eye of the public off the ball and to slowly phase in these policies, these developments. But what do they call for? They openly call call for taxing the West, redistributing wealth to the developing nations, not to help them either, really, just to lower population. They want to redistribute that wealth in a way that curbs their population. Don't empower them. Don't give them homes and things. Just curb the population, kill the West's standard of living, bring everyone into one global government. That's what you see here. And here's the document. You can go read it for yourselves. The next 40 years, transition strategies to the virtuous green path. North, South, East, Global, the virtuous green path of exterminating everyone. Meanwhile, it's all being done in the name of climate change, of global warming, and Paul Joseph Watson reports that penguins, polar bears, glaciers, Arctic ice, and more are all thriving. 
You've got reports from the Toronto Star about how polar bear populations are defying predictions. Uh, instead of curbing down to less than 650, they're still at the 1,000 plus level, even though they've been hunted and other things have happened. You've got twice as many emperor penguins as they thought in Antarctica, as the first ever count from satellites in space confirms a population uh, more than twice the level they thought at 595,000 birds, 600,000 birds, more than the 270 to 350,000 birds they thought existed. And the glaciers aren't melting. You've got to remember the same globalists calling for this world government and saying we have to give up our rights and our way of life due to climate change and the global warming. We're predicting global cooling in the 70s and calling for the same draconian action. And that's just what they do in action. Uh, they just want to curtail human activity, put in a dictatorship, and depopulate the planet. They really could care less about the wildlife. That's just an excuse. I think you know that. We've shown the research. We'll continue to bring it to you. We turn now to our quote of the day. In this possibly terminal phase of human existence, democracy and freedom are more than just ideals to be valued, they may be essential to survival. Those are the words of Noam Chomsky, and we'll be right back in the interview with Holland Van den Neuenhoff, one of the makers of A Noble Lie about the Oklahoma City bombing, as well as Dale Phillips, a member of the investigative committee put together by State Rep Charles Key. Stay tuned, and thanks for supporting InfoWars Nightly News. our biggest contest ever and we're looking for people who love freedom and who want to be all in in the resistance to tyrants so you say you want to fight the new world order why if you were on the radio if you were alex jones you'd really kick some globalist ass well here's your chance we're hiring not one but two new reporters whose reports are gonna be on the radio, whose reports are gonna be on the nightly news, who will even anchor the show. If you're ready, here's your chance to step into my shoes, and I hope you surpass what I've done. Two winners, $10,000 in prizes, and a shot to be a reporter inside the InfoWars.com command center. We're looking to hire one male reporter and one female reporter. And when you win, you win $5,000. Your video gets seen by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people on YouTube. And you get put into the very front of the running to be hired as a reporter slash anchor right here in our operation. Do you have what it takes to be the next Info Warrior? The rules are posted below me here and at InfoWars.com. This is a big deal. You know, the globalists are expanding their global empire, but at the same time, the people are waking up all over the world. We've expanded our operations in the last year. We've added the nightly news five nights a week. We're making more special reports. We're reaching 15 million people every week. In a year, I want that to be 30 million. This is your chance to join the team. I want to see what you can do. But a big hint is this. Can your news piece make the news? Does it get people's attention? Does it educate people? Does it open minds? That's more important than being beautiful or speaking with perfect eloquence as an orator. All of that is important, but we're looking for people that have that magic spark, that fire of liberty in their heart, because I want you to join our team. I want to give you a launch pad so you can really take off and engage the globalist. And if this works, we'll have contests all the time and we'll continue to build this operation. I'm involved in a talent search, looking for people who have the fires of liberty burning in their hearts and their minds. You've got until April 30th to complete your news report and then we'll announce the winners one week later. Are you gonna join the info war? Do you have what it takes? It's up to you. All serious entries will be posted on InfoWars.com. So everybody wins. You're getting the message of liberty out. 
And that's what really matters. But in the final equation, it's not about showing Alex Jones what you got. It's about showing the world and the globalist that no army can stop an idea whose time has come. Join me in the Info War. So you say you want to fight the Info War. You say you want to go head up against the New World Order. You can do a better job than Alex Jones. I know you can. And here's your chance to prove your mettle. enjoy it when the globalists try to poison us and uh, well we resist them via a free market system hello my fellow info warriors alex jones here introducing you to the pro pure family of gravity fed filters now you know that the globalists are filling our water with radioactive isotopes fluoride lead mercury arsenic and one of the few systems that can efficiently and economically remove or reduce down to non-detectable levels, these poisons are gravity-fed filters. And ProPure is the top of the line. Their filters are impregnated with silver, a natural antibiotic. On top of that, they're bigger, so they filter faster. You don't have to prime these the first time you use them. It's amazing. Go to InfoWars.com and click on the shopping cart link uh, to see the entire family of these babies. Now, the fluoride they add to our water is so tiny that most filters can't cut it out. But ProPure has their system that will, again, reduce it to non-detectable levels, almost get all of it out of there. That's also available. And if you look at the different systems they offer, the Pro Pure Big Brush Finish is on a stand, so it's easier on a table or at your restaurant or wherever you have it to go up with a glass or a mug and fill it up. Then there's this big baby right here, the Pro Pure King Large version. Got a lot of different options that come with it. Also, they have the Pro Pure Big, probably one of the best values out there. And of course, it's burnished stainless steel. And then what I use on my RV, something that's great for your hunting cabin or the back porch is the Pro Pure Traveler. Small and portable, but packs a huge punch, cleans out all that garbage. They also have a glass sight spigot, so you don't have to take the top off and look in the bottom area to see how much water. You can see how fast it's filtering with this optional uh, system. The globalist obviously are hitting us through our water. It's time to take control of our lives. It's time to not give our children and families these poisons. And these systems cut it down to non-detectable levels across the board. ProPure is the name. I only promote what I believe in. And I use ProPure in my home and my office. And I recommend that you check out the information on ProPure at InfoWars.com. We already have the lowest price at InfoWars.com on the ProPure Gravity Filter System. But when you add in the 10% off when InfoWarriors use the product code WATER at InfoWars.com, nobody can top it. So again, it's a win-win-win. Stop drinking the poison water. Uh, checkmate the globalists when it comes to your health and support InfoWars.com and the work we're doing here. You know, many revolutionaries rob banks and things and kidnap people for funds. We promote in the free market the products we use that are about preparedness. That's how we fund this revolution against the New World Order in our move to restore our constitutional republic and a spirit of 1776 worldwide. Check it out at InfoWars.com. Pro Pure, top of the line, number one, most powerful and effective and economical gravity fed water system in the world. Pro Pure, available, discounted at InfoWars.com. Don't forget product code WATER to save 10%. It's the latest generation, years in development. Pro Pure is the name. And we are back on the InfoWars Nightly News. We're joined now by one of the filmmakers of A Noble Lie on the Oklahoma City bombing movie. That is Holland Vanden Neuenhoff, as well as Dale Phillips, one of the members of the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee. Guys, thanks for joining me. 
Thank you for having us on, Aaron. Uh, so let's get into the background a little bit. How did this uh, investigative body come about as a response to the official story and then start to get into what are the things you saw, Mr. Phillips? Well, uh, actually, I didn't know Charles Key at the time that, uh, that the bombing took place. Uh, Representative Charles Key was immediately on top of uh, watching the actions of the government in, case, uh, in the case of the bombing. And I actually, um, of course, um, observed uh, him uh, contending with uh, some of them concerning the facts of the bombing and what took place. And um, he was a rarity, and still is for that matter, in his uh, ability and his desire to seek out the truth in, uh, in uh, occurrences such as that. And I didn't know him at that time, but I told my wife at the time that I wanted to uh, really get to know him because it was very impressive uh, that he had the courage to stand up um, uh, against what were obvious uh, lies. Uh, when, when the bombing took place, um, there was, uh, of course, everybody knows what the building looked like and all that, but there was um, uh, five times when they... Um, stopped the rescue operations uh, to take out armaments and other things that the local news media stated uh, were left in the building and that were taken out. Even the governor stated that they had those kind of things in their possession and were uh, researching them and, and trying to use those to figure out who did it. Well, it wasn't very long after that, that uh, after the uh, feds came in on the second day, that the whole story started changing and uh, Charles started coming against the obvious cover up and lies and uh, that uh, impressed me and so I got to know him. Uh, went to have lunch with him and talked to him about uh, what to do. He said he wanted to start uh, the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee and um, would consider having me on it. So I helped him start it actually and uh, I'm glad that I did. So tell us a little more about your background and when did you first become suspicious of what the media was reporting versus uh, the apparent facts on the ground? Well, the very thing that I just told you, the, the fact that uh, they stopped uh, the rescue operations mm -hmm. um, and uh, to take out armaments. And then when the, uh, the feds came in and, and they never mentioned armaments again, never mentioned other explosives found in the building that the governor actually talked about on TV. But those right. kind of things weren't talk talked about again. It's amazing how they can expect people to just totally forget what they were told yesterday. And for, for that matter, it's amazing how many people do forget. In the case of uh, the six years of investigation that we did, uh, we interviewed a lot of people that we uh, uh, rehashed the beginning day, day and a half of what went on. And they would say to us, Oh, yeah, I remember that the news media did report that uh, they were stopping the, uh, uh, the uh, rescue to do this and to do that. But people will forget real quick, and uh, if you just tell them over and over and over that uh, something is black, they will forget that it was white. Uh, so, Holland, a noble lie has so much laid out about this case, and the bombing investigative committee is just one part of it. Uh, help us draw some of the background picture, how big this lie is, why it's still important today, and then let's get back into the investigative committee itself and what they found. Dilgman City bombing is important for people to realize the facts of because it's such a demonstrable case of the official story being utterly false. Uh, you have to remember the Oklahoma City bombing occurred in the infancy of the Internet when the dissemination of information wasn't so rapid as it is today. If they tried something as sloppy as Oklahoma City today, it would gain a lot more exposure. And they probably learned a lot from that attack. But it is such a demonstrable case of the official story being false and a lie that it calls into question every official story for any kind of terrorist event that happens since then and in the future. Sure. Yeah. And then, so let's get back into the Oklahoma City Bombing Investigative Committee. What, what journey did that take? What kind of role did State Rep Charles Key play? And, and what did you find, uh, Mr. Phillips? Well, we actually, um, uh, Charles Key headed up the committee and uh, brought people on the committee. And we even hired our own investigators. Uh, we uh, gathered up uh, public funds just to from people that would, uh, like myself or others, that would give some funds 
to um, to hire investigators, and we had an office staff, and we were starting to uh, uh, pull in information. Uh, we interviewed. Um, uh, I don't really know how many he could tell you, but probably got into hundreds of witnesses uh, from every area of uh, of concern. And uh, because we could see that the government was purposely trying to cover up everything, and the state government seemed to be working with the feds in that regard, that uh, we had to go get our own investigation. Uh, and And we did that, and we were fighting to get a grand jury to look at that, and we did. We had to fight the state all the way, every level, all the way through the state Supreme Court to get the state constitutional uh, provided a grand jury in a case like this. And um, the uh, Bob Macy was the district attorney at that time, and he fought us all the way, uh, every level. And one time in a meeting with him, uh, uh, Charles actually asked him, and you could ask Charles about this sometime, that uh, why are you fighting us every level of this? Why don't you stop fighting us? And he said, they won't let me. And Charles said, who are they? And he wouldn't say. So um, anyway, but we did take it all the way through. We did uh, get the state Supreme Court to honor our request for a grand jury. And we did have a grand jury and we obtained, I don't know what it was, a million dollars or something to help us with the grand jury. Well, lo and behold, they put the grand jury, uh, they put Bob Macy in charge of the grand jury. So they put our enemy in a sense in charge of the grand jury and then gave him the money and he proceeded to investigate us. But that's huge. You've got so many facts of the case not adding up at all in hindsight it's clear what it was, and yet you've got these officials not caring that people in their own state and their own home area were killed from this bombing. They don't care how many lies and cover-ups are going on. He just tells uh, Key to his face that they won't let me stop basically covering this up. That's, I've never heard that before. Well, the thing is, uh, people like Dale Phillips and Charles Key and other people we interviewed, they didn't start out uh, distrusting the government. They wanted truth to be to be done in this case. They were victims, many of them, the people we've interviewed, of the bombing. But when they saw that the government was not pursuing evidence, not pursuing leads, ignoring things that people had seen, manipulating reality, um, they tried to use the system. They went through the petition system. They went through the grand jury. And at every level, the government failed to abide by its own obligations to the citizens. And now, with the noble lie, at least we're reclaiming history. If we can't have some of these people in the witness stand answering harsh questions, at the very least we can reclaim history and stop remembering the lives of those 168 people with a lie. Let's remember them with the truth and seeking real truth and justice instead of covering it up. V.Z. Lawton was is one of our invest, one of the committee members. You may have already interviewed uh, uh, V.Z. I'm not sure. V.Z. is uh, pretty sick right now. Probably can't be interviewed anymore. But um, he was in the building at the time that the uh, explosion went off. And he will tell you that the building was coming down before the truck bomb went off. So obviously there were armaments in the building on the columns that uh, ripped those columns apart, threw them around, that an air blast uh, wouldn't even break. An air blast couldn't break those columns, much less pull them up, twist them around, and throw them around. An air blast would have broken some windows, possibly. That's pretty well it. Sure. Uh, now, in your own role, uh, Mr. Phillips, were you ever intimidated or, or told to shut up about the case? Because we've talked to other cops who were on the scene. Don Browning, I think his name was, his life was threatened. Uh, other people were threatened during the course of the investigation and the grand jury. What did you see along those lines, sir? Actually, um, I never had that happen. I uh, uh, So if I'm making up anything, I'd make that one up. But I, I uh, haven't uh, had that happen. And uh, I will say this, that the, the committee uh, had prayer every time we had a meeting. We had lots of meetings for six years. We had, a, we had a, a protective prayer each time that God would help us go forward and get the, the facts documented for the book that we have. And uh, they, to my knowledge, Charles himself was not uh, threatened. Uh, I was never threatened. 
Sure, and of course, prayer does work. Tell us more about the book or the report you worked on, and how did this play out through the grand jury investigation? Did they ignore the questions that you had all raised uh, in your own investigation, or what happened from that point? No, oh, they didn't want to know anything about our book and didn't want to know anything about our questions. <clears throat> they, uh, they didn't call me in. I was even guarded from that. Charles was called in and a couple others were called in, but uh, for questioning by the uh, grand jury and uh, the very grand jury that we got put together, uh, we got 13,500 signatures and it was only 5,000 required. And, um, but uh, they didn't want to have it. They didn't want any of our questions and didn't want, uh, for that matter, any of our answers. I think this goes back to what you kind of pointed out, Holland, that at the time of the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, they really felt they had control over the media. They could tell blatant lies and still manage them, make sure they had reporters and key witnesses they could control, et cetera. That was probably even less so on 9-11, even though the number of witnesses was multiplied by some factor, uh, the number of people aware of the event around the world, the number of questions, even at a heightened phase. But I think over time you do see an unraveling of the control they assumed they had in 1995, maybe still thought they had in 2001. But now we could see where the power of Internet is really eroding heavily at that. And hopefully uh, knowledge about these events is going to prevent further events in the in the future from happening. Uh, what's your take, Holland? Well, I mean, the false flag attack, if that's what these attacks truly are, and I do personally think they are, um, is an old formula, formula let's hope. Uh, that's what they've used uh, time and time again in the past. But hopefully with the information revolution that we're catching up faster than the cover-up can extend, that we're learning faster than they can cover things up. So I'm hoping that by exposing these operations as soon as they happen and exposing ones in the past, that we are evolving hopefully past the point where they can effectively use a false flag attack against us. And if they do, it might just blow up in their face when they get exposed to the world as the frauds and the criminals and the murderers, the mass murderers they truly are. Dale Phillips, uh, what do you see for the future of the truth? Will the truth continue to come out about Oklahoma City? Uh, do you think that venue is going to be in films like A Noble Lie or in investigative bodies of the future? And where does the country go from here? Where, where's the future of these kind of horrible attacks? Well, you know, I've said forever that uh, government can be as corrupt as they want to be, and you can straighten that out. It's when your news media gets corrupt that you're dead in the water. And our country has gotten to a point now where the MSM, the mainstream media, is pretty well totally corrupt. All of them are controlled uh, by members of organizations that are international. And uh, therefore, they do what they're told, and they uh, you see it happening in this uh, election that's going on right now. You, it's, so the new, main news media is dying, though, pretty fast. Mm -hmm. It just depends on whether they can put laws in force, which, in my opinion, they're trying to do to stamp out the kind of opportunity that's going on right now with me being interviewed. Hey, what do you see for the future also of the extremism issue? So much of the white supremacist movement was supposedly brought in to the Oklahoma City attack, and we see it played out again in the Obama administration, another Democratic administration, a lot of the same officials involved, Eric Holder and others, and they still continue to pursue this line that somehow there's a cadre of extremists out in the country, and on their behalf, they've got to kind of get everyone under control, ask nosy questions, put everyone under suspicion, all to prevent this kind of thing from happening again. Well, there was um, actually the week we released a noble lie in December, uh, an article came out from the uh, the Daily Beast, an organ, the online organ of Newsweek magazine, detailing the profiles and adventures of an undercover FBI agent named Matthews, who had been infiltrating the neo-Nazi and far radical right in the 90s. He had worked for 10 years as an FBI undercover informant. He is a Marine veteran of Vietnam, and he thought he was doing the right thing. But he quit, and this is actually profiled in Newsweek. He quit when he realized that he was, the FBI's job was to actually incite these militias. I mean, the, a lot of these groups are being fed firearms from military bases. It's not like the, some of these uh, far-right militias were stealing weapons. They were actually being fed weapons to incite a fight with the neo-Nazi and far-radical right and some of the militias that were associated with that, uh, truthfully or not. 
And the fact is that that Newsweek article, which mentioned an undercover FBI operation called PACCON, Patriot Conspiracy, which was the FBI operation to infiltrate every far-right organization in the United States in the mid-90s and implicate them in firearms and, uh, f- um, firearms and explosives felonies. Um, PACCON, all mentions of PACCON were cut out of the Newsweek article. That is still sensitive. In fact, one FBI agent said, PACCON will get you killed. And we believe that Oklahoma City was perhaps spawned out of Operation PACCON in the mid-90s. That's very interesting. I think it's true that the uh, what we have going on seems obvious to me that we have every form, whether it's domestic or international or otherwise, of uh, proposed terrorism that the... Um, uh, world leaders, so to speak, if you want to call them, behind the scenes are trying to scare the public into giving up rights, giving up guns, giving up any kind of protection by using the fact that there's a terrorist behind every bush and around every corner. And and it, they're being pretty successful at it at this point. And, but I think whether it's the neo-Nazis or whether it's the skinheads or whether it's uh, all the other things we could name, all of those are being fed to the public on a basis of, uh, you know, we're going to protect you from them. So you need to give up your rights. I totally agree. And I think that's why A Noble Lie is still important. Not only is it a well-made film, very captivating, hit on a lot of details I wasn't aware of, even though I kind of got the larger picture. It was one of these false flags. But the fact is we see them continuing to try to take away our rights uh, under whatever pretext. And then when people shout out about it, uh, cite the Constitution, et cetera, they've got these weird extremist uh, cutouts they could put to deflect the public, keep the public from embracing the very people uh, trying to defend the Constitution as they destroy it. Uh, your, Your closing comments, and we thank you for joining us, of course. Mine? Uh, both of you guys. Uh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, it's good that you brought that up because uh, actually this anniversary, the 17th anniversary on Thursday, April 19th at 7 p.m., We Are Change Oklahoma is going to be passing out 500 free copies of A Noble Lie to everyone who's participating in the anniversary ceremonies uh, downtown at the memorial because we don't want them to remember the slain with a lie. We want to reclaim the truth from history. I very much appreciate uh, the work um, of the group that has taken our book, uh, The Final Report, that we worked uh, six years on and gathered up several hundred thousand dollars of uh, money from the public and hired our own investigators and worked very hard uh, to put together. Um, the, I, very, I very much appreciate uh, them uh, putting this uh, movie together which is kind of based on that book, or at least uh, most of the information, or a lot of information from that book, and uh, dragging up the fact that uh, this kind of thing can happen, uh, and the, the less that is done to come against uh, government lies, the more is going to take place in the future. I can remember when I believe Charles was on uh, the O'Reilly show, and uh, he, they, they gave him a list of questions and then came back, and when they really started questioning, you can ask him about this, but they, they changed the questions totally of what they asked him than what they told him they were going to ask him. Uh, that's not a nice thing to do. But anyway, at the end, when um, uh, he got started talking about uh, the Middle East and so forth and so on, which they had never uh, brought up in the questioning, he made the statement that if you don't, if we don't handle this case right and we don't try to uh, dig into it and protect the public with information that comes from this case, worse things will happen. Voila, 9-11. Mm-hmm. The final report for the Oklahoma Bombing Investigation Committee actually came out three weeks before 9-11. I'm not saying the two are related, but the fact that 9-11 happened kind of drew attention away from the conclusions of the bombing committee. And, and that story was ignored because that was the compilation of years of effort of disproving the official story. And like Dale said, we based a lot of the information in a noble lie upon the final report of the bombing commission. It is interesting, though, that they look for any opportunity to give closure to the issue and forget about the questions that were so painstakingly drawn out. 
And uh, we appreciate you both for joining us. It's nice to meet you, Mr. Dale Phillips. And uh, we'll continue to cover the Oklahoma City issue and this great film, which we also have at Infowars.com. And as you pointed out, the anniversary for OKC is coming up this week, right? Yes, this Thursday, We Are Change Oklahoma is going to be passing out 500 free copies of the movie to everyone going inside for the uh, anniversary ceremonies to try to uh, let them know that there are unanswered questions about the bombing and the people holding these anniversary ceremonies are not remembering the dead truthfully. Uh, they're remembering them with a lie, and that's not right. Thanks again for joining us, and that's all for the InfoWars Nightly News. We'll be back again tomorrow. Don't forget to reach out at prisonplanet.tv and subscribe to support us, or just tell everyone you know about the broadcast. You can find us on the YouTube, the Alex Jones channel as well. Thanks for watching, and good night.